Morning everyone. I'm Nick Slavic, proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company in New Prague, Minnesota. I've been a craftsman for over 20 years. Uh, I'm an enthusiast of all things finishing and this Ask a Painter segment that you're watching is, is a product of that 20 years. Um, you guys send me your questions during the week, you send them during the live feed, and then you can send them uh, after as well. I will collect those up and answer them live um, on this feed every, every weekend, uh, Saturday morning, uh, 9 o'clock. So, I told you that I was going to walk you through a very specific product and, and finishing process in my own shower, which is actually right behind me here. Uh, after we go through that process, I'll, I'll describe the products I use and I'll describe the processing or the finishing process that I used. Then I'll answer your questions uh, that I've gathered up from the week and then if you guys have any sending over the live feed, I'll answer those as well. So, a little background on this project. My wife and I and kids, we live in a 1918 craftsman home. Uh, what's very unique to this house is there are four walk-in closets on the second floor, which is crazy. I mean, closets are sparse in old homes anyway, but we actually have four. Because we had four, uh, we did not need this one. This one was just a storage closet that we used. Uh, it was, you're able to stand up in, it's got an angled wall, but it's still useful. We have four children. Uh, we needed a place to shower and bathe them. All we had was the original clawfoot tub in this bathroom here. So we needed a waterproof room, you know how kids are when they get crazy uh, in bath time, shower time and stuff. Everything gets wet. So my goal was to create a perfectly waterproof room so I wouldn't have to worry about ruining the character of this old house, water leaks through the second floor, things like that. So I will show you, uh, now I'll flip this guy around and I'll walk you through uh, what specifically we did to this bathroom. So as you can see, here is the old door to the walk-in closet. Uh, the trim that you see uh, currently in, around it, that's the original trim, the 100-year-old trim to this house. Uh, that is intact. Uh, we completely gutted the walk-in closet. Uh, I reframed it, uh, we boarded it up, and then I had a tile guy uh, come in and completely waterproof the room. We laid penny round tile, which are very traditional, just pure circular round tiles thus the name Penny Round, a very traditional finish. And then we did a standard three by five subway with a nice dark grout, which would have been also traditional. Uh, the window you see on the far end was something that we had added. Uh, there was no natural light in here. So I thought it would be a good addition to pop in a little waterproof uh, sealed window. That one doesn't open. Um, now, the, the specific painting process that I used in here was the trim around this window matches the trim in the rest of the house uh, in size and profile, but it is not wood. Uh, it's actually a product called Azek, A-Z-E-K. It's a cellular PVC. Uh, if you think about uh, the white PVC pipes that you use for plumbing uh, and drains and things like that, uh, that's exactly what that stuff's made out of. And you can't tell the difference once it's all painted from wood. Now, um, just like we talked about last week, uh, you can paint anything, but you have to go through a, a certain prep process and you have to have reasonable expectations for it. Uh, painting plastic is probably one of the more difficult things you can do to get a good adhesion. So uh, again, just like I always say, go find the technical data sheets uh, for all the products. And I actually called up AZEC and talked to a rep and asked them how to uh, how to coat this process. So they said uh, use a water-based primer and then coat it with a, either an enamel or just a standard interior house paint. Uh, so what I did, uh, I got my uh, Kiehl's water-based premium primer and uh, one of the <laughs> 20 years of experience, one of the things that it's taught me is that you know when you enamel trim inside a house, uh, you're going to need uh, to get rid of the brush strokes. So uh, there's a product called Floetrol F-L-O-E-T-R-O-L. -E it's a paint additive that you add eight ounces per gallon of paint, uh, and it opens the paint up. It gives it a longer extended wet period. So uh, when you brush on coatings like interior trim and things like that, uh, it'll level out, and you still get a tiny bit of brush strokes, but you don't get uh, as much as if you if you just use the standard paint. So here is, here is the trim on this side. Here, I, I milled it to match the rest of the historic millwork in the house. The jam you see is also AZEC, the, the wide part here, and then the casing here is AZEC as well. I wanted this part to be completely waterproof. I pulled off the historic trim on the other side as well. 
I coated the backside of it, sealed it all up, and then put it all back together. And this is about four or five years later of daily shower use. Uh, there's six of us in our family, so we get tons of, uh, tons of use in here, and this stuff looks as good as the day that it went up, like I said, four or five years ago. So after the, after the priming process, I actually added that flow trail to the primer as well to get rid of the brush strokes in there. Uh, leveled out really nicely. I, again, I did my scratch test and my X test, just like from uh, last week when I talked about painting vinyl siding, and it adhered perfectly. So I sanded it, uh, sanded the primer smooth, and then I used two coats of Benjamin Moore Waterborne Impervo. Uh, since then, water, uh, the, the Impervo line, both the oil and the water base, have been my favorite for a long, long time. But recently I've switched to the Benjamin Moore Advanced, which is a hybrid of the both. It's actually an oil molecule suspended in water. So four or five years ago, this was a cutting edge technology. I did that, added flow trial to the Impervo as well, and then got a really beautiful sort of finish, held up to the water perfectly. Uh, we can clean it, we can scrub it, uh, get rid of the soap residue, things like that. It works out perfectly. And with that flow trial, then it really smooths out um, all the brush strokes and things like that. Like I said, you're never gonna get rid of those completely unless you spray, but uh, if you get a really soft nylon bristle brush, add the flow trial to your primer and paint, you get a really, really smooth finish. And this stuff, I've been very surprised. Um, I'm, I'm normally a skeptic of these new products that come online. Uh, just like last week we talked about the LP Smart side, uh, I usually wait a little longer to see how these products handle, but um, in theory this Azek product, uh, being cellular PVC, is going to last a long time. So. So far, so good. Four or five years with nearly daily uh, use in the shower. So, if you guys have any other questions about that, uh, send them over to the live feed, I'll answer that. But that is, I get a lot of questions about uh, waterproof coatings in the bathroom here. The gray you see behind me here is that Benjamin Moore uh, spa and bath paint that I experimented with probably a year or two ago here. And so far, we're not getting a lot of the water sagging, you know, for, for people who don't have vented uh, bathrooms that are vented properly, you get a lot of moisture in the air and it actually starts to sag down the walls a little bit. That's not the case uh, since we did this stuff. I've always used a standard sort of eggshell or satin interior wall paint and uh, since we switched over to that stuff, it's a, it's a more matte finish, but we haven't had a lot of those moisture sagging issues uh, and it wipes up really easily when we get, you know, hair care products and other things on it. So. Um, now we can go over a couple questions that I collected from you guys from the week. Uh, Jim Callahan actually sent me a picture of a corner hutch in his house. It's painted. Um, I, I'm thinking his house is, you know, from the, from the lay of the land there, maybe somewhere between 35, 45 years old. And I think Jim's on the feed. You can, you can correct me if, you're, if your house is a little older or newer than that. Um, it's painted. He would like to restore it. Uh, like I said before, anything can be painted, anything can be restored. Uh, the, the first question that I normally ask is, uh, Jim said 1948, okay, so it's a little older than I thought. So, anything can be restored, anything can be painted, it's just, uh, the question I always ask is, should you restore it? Uh, if that is something that's original to the house and it would add to the character of the house or add to the design scheme that you're doing, definitely restore it. Uh, as a restorationist and a preservationist, I'm always in favor of restoring as long as it fits the design of the house and it, and it maintains the original integrity of the house. Uh, if it's something that was added in the 70s or the 80s, you may want to be circumspect about it because the materials used on later dates weren't as good as things done in the 40s and 50s. A lot of the wood that was used in construction at that time was still sort of the old growth, slow growing timbers. It's much more stable, it takes finishes better, and it's actually something worth saving. Now. If you've made the determination that this is something you want to do, uh, there's a couple ways to go about it. Um, there is the professional, high toxic, uh, very fast way to do it, and there's the sort of more homeowner, eco-friendly, safer, slower way to do it. Methyl ethyl chloride is a very, very caustic paint stripper. Comes in metal cans, it's got the skull and crossbones all over it. Uh, I use this stuff in my shop or in restoration projects when I have to save architectural millwork on a historic home. Uh, you got to suit up. You got to go uh, full white jumpsuit. You got to go thick. Uh, not even the not even the yellow gloves that you do dishes with. You got to go uh, hazardous waste gloves. 
you got to seal it all up with duct tape. You got to go mask. Uh, I use actually a full face respirator. It's a, it, it seals up from the top of your head to your chin uh, with the two uh, respirator canisters there. Completely seals up your face because that stuff's been known to kind of slop back at you. Hood, uh, boot covers, everything. You really want to have a ventilated area. Uh, when I work in my shop or when I work in a historic home, I get two fans going, one on either side of the house, one pushing, one pulling to push that air and pull that air through the house to, to evacuate all those methyl ethyl chloride fumes. Now, with, with the professional process, the methyl ethyl chloride, this is still readily available, at least in our part of the country. You apply it, give it five or 10 minutes, you can actually see the paint bubbling up, scrape off what you have, and then my process from there is to take a, a stiff nylon brush with paint thinner and actually scrub the rest off, wiping with a cotton rag, scrub the rest, cotton rag. Uh, my only caution uh, is get a five gallon bucket, fill it with water. When you use rags, uh, and, and it comes in contact with anything, mineral spirits, uh, oil stain, methyl ethyl chloride, when you're done with them, submerge them in water because those have been known to spontaneously combust. Uh, when you're in this professional process, after you've done that, you should be down to uh, normal wood very quickly. Uh, after that, you let it dry for a couple days. I scrub it down again with rubbing alcohol just to get rid of the rest of the residue on there. And then I go uh, to the finishing process and you can decide from there if it's a bunch of old chipped up alligator paint and you remove that and you want to start over with a new painted finish, then you prime it and paint it. If you want to um, uh, restore it to the regular wood, then at that point you can either stain it a different color and varnish it, or just varnish it clear, uh, whatever you want uh, as far as the finish goes there. The more homeowner way to do this is, is the eco-friendly products, uh, the paint strippers. Uh, 3M makes some, there's co companies called Strip Away, uh, Easy Strip, things like that. Uh, the only downside to this is they're not as caustic and they take a longer time. So what you want to do is apply the eco-friendly paint stripper. A lot of this stuff is water-based, it's citrus-based, it's things like that, and, and it's very safe. There's, there's little to no fumes. You don't have to suit up in all the crazy gear. Uh, you apply it to it, and sometimes it can take between four and eight hours and sometimes even overnight to get through all that layers of paint. So that's the downside. That's the only reason I don't use that a lot of the time. One thing you can do uh, to help this process though is if you're going to strip that corner cabinet, apply your eco-friendly or your methyl ethyl chloride and I actually cover those with plastic to keep it wet. Um, that stuff, all, all stripper has a tendency to skin over and dry out by evaporation and if it does dry out it'll stop working. You want to keep it wet so I lay plastic over it um, making sure that the plastic doesn't react with any of the chemicals. That'll keep it wet and keep the paint stripper working so if you're going to use an eco-friendly paint stripper Apply it, lay the plastic on. I would wait, you know, eight hours, sometimes even overnight, making sure that it stays wet. The next day, it'll just come right off. Depending on how many layers of paint, you may need to do that process over and over and over again, but that's, that's basically the gist of it. Um, the only thing to remember is to neutralize the stripping chemicals after you strip that down. Whether you're gonna paint it, varnish it, decorative finish, leave it natural, whatever, neutralize that. My favorite is rubbing alcohol because it's, it's a hot enough solvent where you actually get rid of some of the stripper and reactivate it, but it'll also uh, clean up the wood and make it very acceptable to new finishes. Um, I got an inquiry this week uh, from somebody here in New Prague. They have a three season porch, all knotty pine walls, and they wanted a whitewash look to it. And they were trying to decide whether to do it themselves or to have me do it. I, uh, they sent me a bunch of pictures. I wrote them up a quote for it. Um, it's a very sort of unique project again. <laughs> uh, most people, uh, whitewash is a very popular finish uh, interior nowadays, whether it's just painted white, white boards, or it's the sort of white translucent look that you can see the grain through. It's kind of that East Coast, Cape Cod, beachy kind of look. So they wanted this on the outside uh, in a three season porch. So you have um, three walls sort of covered, uh, you know, by, from the elements, but you are still exposed to the elements. You know, and in Minnesota here, we go between 100 degrees and we go negative 40, snow, rain, sleet, hail, everything in between. So we really got a wide range of uh, weather that you have to deal with here. The basic of a whitewash finish, uh, you can get this two main ways. Number one, there are products called pickling stains, uh, just like pickles that you eat. Um, it's, a, it's a white oil stain that you apply and wipe off and that'll leave you sort of the you know translucent white sort of weather beaten look to it 
and then you can top coat it with you know either an oil varnish or a water-based uh, varnish. Uh, the other way to do it, I've actually done furniture for a client of mine with this. Uh, we we're looking for a custom uh, opacity in that, and the pickling stains were too light. They wanted to hide the grain a little more, so what I actually did was took flat white ceiling paint inside, and I mixed it in mason jars with water in varying degrees, starting at maybe 10 to 1, uh, 10 parts water, 1 part paint, doing test boards, a whole bunch of test boards in my shop with uh, you know pine boards, and then I would step it up, you know, maybe eight to one, maybe six to one, two to one, and, and seeing the various opacities. Uh, and at some point you hit diminishing returns where it'll either, either just completely obstruct the grain or, you know, it'll be so translucent you wipe it all off. Uh, after I got approval from these test boards uh, from my client uh, for the certain opacity with my custom mix, you know, ceiling paint, you know, distilled water thing, um, I actually used a water-based uh, varnish inside the house. Now. For any of you who have listened to me for the first couple of these things, excuse me, <coughs> you guys know that I am morally opposed to water-based wood finishes. The only circumstance when I use water-based uh, clear wood finishes is either when I do a decorative finish in somebody's house and they want it protected, I'll put a mat or a flat or even a satin water-based varnish over it to protect it. Uh, the only other uh, time I use that is in these white finishes, and the reason for that is that oil varnish will naturally yellow over time and give you that amberish sort of warm look. Water-based varnish and water-based lacquers and other water-based uh, wood finishing things, they do not yellow over time. They stay crystal clear. Um, if, if you use an oil-based uh, varnish over a white-washed substrate, it'll turn very yellow very quickly. Usually within about 12 months, it'll, it'll go back to that amber sort of look. So, uh, I actually had very good luck. I think at the time I used a uh, water-based polyurethane from Sherwin-Williams. It's very tough. Uh, I visited this, it was actually a vanity in an old farmhouse restoration, uh, sort of a uh, shaker style uh, vanity open with, with legs and things. I visited this project about four or five years later and it looked exactly like the day I put it in. So it seems like that water-based polyurethane is holding up well. Nothing I would ever use on a whole house for architectural millwork, but for that specific product, in that process, in this design scheme, it worked out perfectly. So uh, the basics of the whitewash. Make the wood white either by pickling stain or by your custom made uh, white paint and water mix. Just make sure it's not anything with uh, shine. I used the ceiling paint because it's the flattest of the flat paint and mixed it with water and then use water-based varnish over the top. Now for this uh, three season porch outside, this is a very unique circumstance. You probably won't run into this ever again, but I recommended that this person use, normally I would use a spar varnish, a marine varnish, a sailboat varnish, something outside that's got that extra UV inhibitor. There is actually a bunch of companies now making water-based marine exterior varnish. Uh, I've experimented with them a little. It's about what you would expect if you have any experience with oil varnish and water-based finishes. You know, uh, I don't think you'll get the life of the oil outside, but in this circumstance, you really don't have any other choice. If you don't want your wood to yellow, you have to use that water-based exterior marine varnish. Now, again, you, you guys know I'm sticklers on technical data sheets. If you read the technical data sheets for these products, uh, any clear or translucent finish outside universally has to be coated uh, 12 to 18 months. And in Minnesota, we can't do an 18 month interval because after 18 months, some, some of that will land on you know, a winter season. So basically, in my area of the country, uh, front door, uh, pickled wood on a three season porch, uh, a deck with a translucent finish, just remember, every 12 months, you're gonna have to recoat that just like sunblock to keep that UV inhibitor uh, from eating that wood away. So, all right, let's see here. Okay, so next question I received. Um, somebody sent me a, a message during the week here. It said, Nick, my wife has picked out colors for the outside of her house, and I don't exactly agree with them. Uh, they're two earth tones, two grays that are fairly light and fairly subdued. I would like to see more color. What to do? Uh, I've done about 150 color consultations uh, a year for the last 10 years, and the dynamic, uh, the dynamic between spouses on a job site is sometimes very interesting. You sort of have to walk this line. 
Uh, most of the time, uh, I get very lucky in that one person, maybe the husband, maybe the wife, doesn't matter, uh, is very involved in the color choice and has very strong opinions, and the other person does not. Um, that's most of the time, and that, that's a problem that takes care of itself. Uh, in this particular case, uh, what I found is that uh, in maybe one out of ten, both people have very specific design ideas for the house and, and they don't really meet in the middle. Um, what I found is that uh, the men I talk to on the job sites usually have stronger opinions about exterior house color. I think it, it must make more of a statement, uh, it's, it's outward, I think people can visually see it. Uh, uh, the women usually have a stronger opinion about interior colors versus exterior colors. Um, again, just, just playing the odds, playing the numbers, that's what I've found over, you know, probably 1,500 color consultations over the years. Uh, most men will pick uh, the bolder colors outside, like I said, for that reason. Um, I guess the, the only... I, I, Usually these color consultations take about a half an hour or 45 minutes, and in that you usually find a compromise. Whereas, you know, if, if we're going with a gray, and I can get the other person to agree that, well, you know, if we're going neutral, it's either tan or gray. If they can agree on the gray, we can uh, step it up or step it down uh, to sort of, you know, assuage the other spouse in the deal. If, if, if in this case, uh, the wife picked a little bit lighter colors, uh, but they're still neutral, we might be able to bump them down darker or at least take one of those colors, make it much darker to have the other spouse sort of come online with it. That even though we'll maintain the neutral color scheme, we can go with a very deep color. And uh, what I've found through working with color over the years is that even if you take a neutral color, a gray or a brown, and go all the way down to the bottom of the color card, chocolate brown, deep gray, almost black, it's still a neutral color because it's gray or brown. Uh, that can usually uh, you know, persuade the other spouse that, you know, this is something we can live with and, you know, it's something, it's a good compromise. Now, if not, if still the other, the other person says, we just need something else, there's always the front door, go crazy with the front door. Do regal red, do a yellow, do a blue, do a green, make it as bright and crazy as you want. It's only a quart of paint and it's only an hour of your time to change it versus, you know, the whole house or the whole front of a house. Uh, always think about adding shutters. If there's not shutters there already, it could be done in a, in a sort of sophisticated way. Uh, garage doors, too. If it doesn't throw off the uh, aspect uh, ratio of the house where one color is, is represented too much than the other, do that. If there is none of this to do, don't discount landscaping, uh, outdoor furniture, something you can hang on your house. Uh, you know, most people have above their front garage a large gable end or some area where they could hang some art piece or something with visual interest. So if we can't do it with paint, we'll do it somehow with something else. Pots, um, you know, like I said, landscaping too. It takes a little while for the landscaping to come online, but you can get some really vibrant colors and flowers. Uh, that's a little out of my purview, at least from a painter, but I at least offer this as, as a second way to go around this. So most of the time, <coughs> excuse me, we find a compromise somewhere in there. And normally uh, it happens because one person wants really crazy bright colors, the other person does not, and I usually, I meet with them, I walk through this color process, give them some suggestions, and then I set them loose on uh, neighborhoods of new homes, uh, maybe at the executive level, that use three or four colors a piece so they can see kind of what's cutting edge. Uh, in my area of the country, we have a thing called Parade of Homes where builders put forth a new home, uh, they list it on a website, and you can actually tour this, and that kind of shows you what's at the cutting edge of our building industry. That helps a lot, too. Uh, and then there's nothing more useful nowadays in picking colors than a Google image search. Most of the colors that I use are Benjamin Moore colors, and then I translate them into whatever finish I end up doing. My, my go-to exterior paint is, is just happens to be a Benjamin Moore, so the colors translate perfectly into that. <coughs> Excuse me. For interior, I use a different paint, and, but I color match everything. Like I said, nothing more useful than a Google image search. Benjamin Moore is used mostly by home builders, uh, by, by a lot of homeowners, and, and by almost every designer I work with, uh, they all spec Benjamin Moore colors. So when you go on Google and do image search for Revere Pewter uh, exterior home, 
you're going to get about 53,000 images of a Revere Pewter Benjamin Moore home. You're going to actually be able to see that color in action on a house somewhere. And if you haven't found your particular style of house, you just got to kind of scroll through and keep looking. And, and the Benjamin Moore colors are used sort of universally by so many people that you're going to find a lot of uh, images on there. Sort of the same with Sherwin Williams, not as much as I found. And then when you get into, you know, Bear, Olympic, Dutch Boy, things like that, a little tougher to find images. But Benjamin Moore, if nothing else, you can at least find the images on the internet there. So after I do my color consultation, I set my homeowners loose on, you know, newer neighborhoods to see what's been going on. Uh, I send them loose on a Google image search. And then if they still haven't decided, the end all and be all to help them pick color is to make them do samples on their own house. I can suggest colors. I used to do this for my homeowners. I actually used to go get half pints of paint and paint them all over the house and show them, but it was sort of an endless process. And I found that if the homeowner didn't have any skin in the game, they would endlessly pick uh, options for their house and, and the samples just got out of hand. So the way to limit that is I will give them as much advice as they want. I will show them houses that I've done. I will point them in the right direction to other houses in our area or neighborhoods they can look at, help them with the Google search. And then there, it's up to them to go down to the local hardware store or paint store, get the samples, try them on the house. And magically, people end up doing four samples instead of 12 when they used to have me do it. So uh, by having them invest in the color process, I found that uh, their air built to zero in on a color much quicker than if I was just to endlessly suggest colors for them. At the end of the sample process, 99% of all my people have picked a color that they just love for their house. There are still some people that are ambivalent about it, don't know what to do, maybe have too many options. If I give it a month, it usually takes care of itself. Asking other neighbors, uh, sleeping on it is a great thing in, in this case. Normally they will come to some conclusion on their own. Asking your neighbors, asking your friends and relatives, I found yeah, if you're, if you're trolling for ideas, if you don't even know where to start, yeah, that's a good thing to do. If you've picked two or three colors, sample them on your house and can't make up your mind, do not ask your neighbors, do not ask uh, relatives, do not ask everybody else what they think. I found that to actually harm the process in it. If you've gotten that far, you need to be sure yourself to know that you've done your homework, you've done this, and most of the time when people are down to the three samples and can't pick, they're so close in shade that, you know, at that point you could, they could let me pick, flip a coin, and they would never know the difference between the three of them. If they've gotten down to the, the three samples, one is yellow, one is purple, one is green, they just need more time. They need to see more houses, they need to have inspiration, divine intervention, whatever happens in the color process. but. Um, by doing this, I found that my jobs, these color consultations, I found that my jobs go much smoother uh, because my, my, the quality of my work is, is steady and even and predictable and we do this you know, high quality on every job, but if the color's not right, it doesn't matter how good of a job you do on the house. So you know, they, they won't appreciate your quality if they don't like the color. So uh, I do this free for all my people only because in the long run, uh, it, makes, uh, it makes my life a lot easier and rarely, maybe once a year, we're done with the house and somebody says, you know, I think that color should have been a little brighter or maybe we can add it in a few more places. And that's fine. Uh, that's, that's so personality driven that there's really nothing you can do to mediate that during the color process. Some people just need to see the finished product before they do that and it, it's part of the job, so. Um, Anne asked, what finish do you recommend for kitchen walls? Uh, my kitchen uh, ends up being a uh, Benjamin Moore Aura, which is their top of the line uh, interior paint. I've used all the Ace Hardware offerings. I've used all the Sherwin Williams offerings. Um, the reason I used Benjamin Moore Aura this last time is uh, not only is it their highest end paint. Uh, I wanted a I wanted a flatter finish on my walls. Uh, because we have an old plaster house, sometimes there's dips and waves and cracks and things like that, and I didn't want a lot of those flaws to show through. So the flatter the paint you use, the less flaws you're going to see in your wall. Uh, common sense, or everyone you ask, will tell you, go semi-gloss, go satin, go, go something very high and shiny uh, in a kitchen so you can wipe up splatters or whatever else. I found that you can go with a higher end paint, lower shine, and it'll still be washable. If you go with a really crappy paint, 
you got to go very high shine because even their high shine paints aren't that washable. Uh, so I used the uh, highest end Benjamin Moore product, used the eggshell finish, which is a lower shine, hides all the flaws, but we don't have a backsplash behind my old stove. Uh, and we just wipe up all the, all the grease and splatter from the wall anyway. So it, it turns out really well. Another benefit of that Benjamin Moore Aura, uh, or you know the highest end Sherwin Williams offering, which is uh, Duration or Emerald, is it hides so well. I've never done a job with the highest end interior paint where you had to do more than two coats over any color. Uh, that includes if you have a ruby red dining room and you want to turn it pure white or off white, two coats over, it's a perfect finish. I use that in my kitchen because I had a very deep uh, gray color. We wanted to lighten it up. I used Navajo White, which is one of my go-to off-whites. Uh, two coats around there, covered perfectly, and it looks great. And yeah, it's, it's, it's holding up to all my kids. You know, with my four kids, we got the plastic toys. They With wheels, they run into the wall, and it handles itself really well. Okay. If that's it for you guys for the questions this week, I appreciate you tuning in here. Um, Please uh, share this with the people uh, that you know. Uh, share this with your Facebook friends, Instagram friends, Twitter friends. Uh, I put a post on Facebook uh, with links to Floetrol, with links to the Benjamin Moore products that I listed for my shower here. Uh, I also put a picture of Jim's corner cabinet if you guys want to take a look and see if that's something that you would tackle. Um, I have a podcast up with Tom Reber. <coughs> Excuse me. He's a business coach for contractors. If you go to iTunes, Tom Reber, his podcast is called Strongpreneur Nation Podcast, like Strong Entrepreneur. Uh, this last week, I actually submitted an article uh, to a group called Blogging Painters. They're an online resource for the painting industry. Uh, they do a little bit of everything on that website, uh, and I thought my particular a specific view on the industry, you know, I may not be able to offer any more technical expertise than any other professional painter out there, but I sort of uh, wrote a, a short article about my time at the last Painting and Decorators Conference in, in New Orleans this last year, and how I showed up with a super naive attitude. Uh, I learned a ton in the process, and uh, I've had, uh, it sort of gave me a crisis of faith about where I stand in the painting industry, but since then, I've sort of come to terms with it. I've talked to a lot of people, and, and you know, through my own um, you know, experience, I've sort of come to terms with everything. I wrote about that. Uh, I wrote about my philosophy on owning a painting business and being an entrepreneur and, and the play between the both of those. And then I also offered a challenge to our industry. So it's on Blogging Painters. Uh, if you go on Facebook and look up Blogging Painters or do a Google search for Blogging Painters, my article is on there. I included a bunch of these interesting shots that I did with a local photographer where uh, we styled it to look like a late 1800s painter uh, and it's on my farm right outside of town so it, it's got my old truck, my farm, some old clothes, we kind of made it look old, it's fun. So if the article is no good at least you got a picture to look at and uh, let me see if there's any last um, questions here. Do I travel to Texas? <laughs> I've actually been to an island in Florida to paint, I've been to Utah, I've been to California, I'm trying to think if I travel. Oh, tons of cabins up north in Minnesota. So for those I trust, I do travel. Uh, it's product, uh, project dependent and time dependent as well. I got a very understanding wife and kids, and uh, those things end up being more passion projects than anything else, uh, and more of an adventure for me. So let's see if we got any. Oh yeah, uh, Anne asked. My husband wants to know if there's a website you can load a photo of your house and play with different colors. Uh, this is my nuclear option. Uh, when the homeowner can't pick a color and it's somebody that I know just needs that extra step, Benjamin Moore, Sherwin-Williams, those are the two I go to. On their websites, they have color tools. You upload a digital image of your house, then you have to carefully take these tools and outline which sections. You can, you can label them A, B, and C, A for trim, B for siding, and uh, C for accent, and you can actually go through their color libraries and digitally imprint on there. It's not a foolproof tool. It takes a ton of time to get everything perfectly the way you want it. And the colors are just digital overlays on your house. So they're sort of translucent. Uh, you know, it's not perfect. It's not going to show you exactly what your house is going to be like, but if you're deciding between purple, yellow, green, or orange, that will get you to one of those first. So uh, with that said, uh, thank you guys for watching. Share this with the people you know. I uh, hope you, this helps your painting projects. 
Uh, check out those things that I have. Always, you can reach me at www.nickslavic.com. Every Saturday morning, 9 a.m., I'll be here answering your questions. Uh, with my 20 years of experience, uh, not only with painting, but with the uh, people who own the homes, there's nothing I can't answer as far as the painting industry goes. So, uh, thank you guys for tuning in, and send me your questions this week. We'll talk to you later.